things I fear bow down to you then knee shake when you speak what I'm afraid of you have control of it don't make sense if anything so if the earth gives way if the waters roar I will be still because I know there is no war there is no soul there is not anything stronger than my God there is no curse there is no disease there is no enemy stronger than
Hey everybody, welcome to Revolution Students Online. So glad that each and every one of you are joining us tonight. Uh, before we get going, I want to share with you a few really awesome, exciting announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, this Sunday we are coming back together uh, in person uh, uh, at church, at Revolution Church, as a church. It's going to be a little bit different. There's not going to be uh, much of like a big, long sermon. It's going to be more of a worship service. We're not going to have kids ministry or anything like that, but it's just going to be really cool to gather together under one roof again. And so if you're comfortable uh, with it, come join us this Sunday. Uh, also, uh, to my students, I hope you guys are pumped. Uh, this week we announced that we are starting youth group back on June 3rd. If you're excited about that, go ahead and hit that heart hit that heart button as much as you possibly can, okay? Because I'm so excited to meet together with you guys again on June 3rd, Wednesday, June 3rd. And then June 10th, the Wednesday after that, that's when we're starting Summer Nights. And Summer Nights, if you don't know, is awesome. Every single night of the summer, we blow it out. We have an awesome time. Uh, and each night has a theme. And so we're going to start Summer Nights on June 10th with our tacky prom theme. And so uh, go ahead and plan out your outfits. Uh, plan out your uh, Summer Nights because it's going to be incredible. I cannot wait to see you guys June 3rd. Um, all right, so let's get into what we're talking about. Uh, tonight, we're talking about something that everyone deals with. Um, men and women, young and old, middle schoolers and high schoolers, whether you're black, white, purple, green, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, you deal with what we're talking about tonight. And what's been cool about these live streams is that We've been reaching a lot of different people from different backgrounds uh, since we started kind of doing this and pushing this more uh, than we usually do. And, and so whoever you are watching this, wherever you are watching this, don't tune out, okay? If you got the time, hang out with us tonight because what we're going to talk about, it applies to you. Uh, it applies to everyone. Here's the thing. We're in a series called How Faith Works. And what we're doing is we're reading an entire book of the Bible together, a book called James. In fact, I think this is like the 12th week <laughs> that we've been in this sermon series. And so we've been really trying to get as much as we can from this book of the Bible. And we're learning what genuine and real faith in Jesus Christ looks like from this guy named James, who is actually the brother of Jesus. See, we live we live in the Bible Belt, okay? Uh, at least for those of us who are watching in Crossville, Tennessee, we live in the Bible Belt. And, and so in this area, a lot of people, they say they have faith. They say that they're Christians. They come to church, they raise their hand in the worship song, and they say amen during the sermon. But in the Bible Belt, we have this tendency to say we're Christians, to say we have faith in Jesus, but we don't really live like it. So it's really important for us to, us to understand what real and genuine faith in Jesus looks like. How do you live out your faith? James has been answering that question for us every single week of this series. And tonight, James is going to talk to us about something that we all deal with in life. James is going to talk to us about conflict. He's going to talk to us about tension. He's going to talk to us about arguments and fights. Tonight, James is going to talk to us uh, about how someone with real, genuine faith in Jesus is supposed to deal with conflict. Because, guys, you can't avoid conflict, but the question is, how do you respond to it? How do you respond to conflict? Everyone deals with this in their life. Whether you're uh, stranded on an island all by yourself, you're still going to deal with conflict. If there's anything that we learn from the movie Castaway, it's that. I mean, Tom Hanks is stranded on this island all by himself. He has nobody. There's not even animals on the island, so we can't even have a pet. But this volleyball washes up on the shore. He paints a smiley face on the volleyball with his own blood. And, and the volleyball is a Wilson brand volleyball, so he names the volleyball Wilson, and Wilson becomes his friend. And, and eventually, Tom Hanks actually has a fight, a physical fight, with the volleyball. He has conflict with the volleyball. So whether you're stranded it on an island, you're still going to have conflict. Everyone deals with conflict. And there's no better time than now to talk about this, right? Because we've been quarantined. And maybe for some of us, we've been quarantined in a house with someone that we already had conflict with. And so for some of us, it's been like a cage match, right? It's been rough. There's been conflict in the McKenzie house during quarantine, that's for sure. I mean, I'm living in a house. I'm quarantined in a house uh, with a child who's in his terrible twos. And also, 
with a pregnant wife. And so there have been moments where I've legitimately feared for my safety, for my life. Like I'll say something and I'll be like, oh, I, well, I probably shouldn't have said that. Or I'll respond to my wife a certain way and I'll be like, ooh, probably shouldn't have responded that way. And then she'll get all quiet. And that's when I know I've really messed up when she gets quiet, right? So some days, like I'll just spend the whole day looking over my shoulder because, you know, we've got guns and knives in our house. And, and my wife, Michaela, she watches like a concerning amount of true crime TV shows. Okay, so I gotta, I gotta be really careful. So conflict is something we all struggle with, even me, even pastors, especially pastors. And James is gonna talk about that tonight. Y'all, anytime that you read a book of the Bible, you have to remember what came before the chapter or the verse that you're reading. Verses and chapters, they were put in there after the verses, after the uh, scripture was already written. Um, we put them in there because they're useful for memorizing and separating different sections of the Bible and, and quoting scripture and that kind of thing. That's why we have these numbers, these verses, these chapters. But when you're studying your Bible, it's almost, uh, it's almost better to try to erase these numbers and erase these divisions in your head. And that's especially true tonight. Because we need to look at what James was talking about in the passage before, the one we're going to be reading tonight, to really understand what he's saying. What was James talking about before this? What were we talking about last week? Well, last week, James was talking about true wisdom. And what did he end with? He ended by saying that true wisdom is peaceful. True wisdom is peaceful. Let's, let's pull up on the screen the last verse that we read last week. This is James 3, 17 through 18. James said, But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and listen to this, willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. So James ended last week. He ended chapter 3 by talking about how true wisdom seeks out peace. But foolish people, dumb people, look for fights and conflict, but wise people look for peace. People who have real wisdom from God look for peace. Keep that in your mind. Keep that in your mind as we go tonight, because that's what James was talking about last week at the end of chapter three, and that's what he's still talking about at the beginning of chapter four, which we're going to be in tonight. And listen to how James starts. He starts with a question, a really good question, actually. This is James 4.1, but this is just part of the first verse of chapter 4. I'm just going to read you part at first. It says, James says, What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? What causes fights among you? Do you have fights? Do you have someone in your life that you're constantly having fights with? If so, what causes those fights? What causes fights between you and your mom or you and your dad? What causes fights between you and your brother or you and your sister? What causes fights between you and your friends? What causes fights between you and your boyfriend or you and your girlfriend? Or if you're older and you're watching this and you're married, what causes fights between you and your husband or you and your wife? What causes fights between you and your teachers or you and your coaches? What causes those fights? How would you answer that question if I asked you personally? you would probably answer, you would probably respond the same way that I would. You would say, well, they did this, or they said that. You would not believe what they did. You would not believe what they posted. You would not believe what they said about me. Them, them, them. That's me. That's what I would say. If someone said, Brandon, why do you have a problem with that person? Well, they did this. You wouldn't believe what they did. That's how we respond. You would say, them. You would say, they are the problem, but James gives a different answer. Let's read the whole first verse. James 4.1, it says, What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? Within who? Within you. So what causes fights between you and people in your life? You say them. James says you. I'm going to read uh, you the next couple verses I want you to listen to how many times James says the word you in these next couple verses. These, this is James 4, 2-3. James says, 
you want what you don't have. So you scheme and kill to get it. Brandon, I've never killed anybody. Well, Jesus said, if you hate someone in your heart or if you do something out of hate, it's the same as murder. So yes, you have killed people. You are a murderer. You want what you don't have. So you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war and take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. James is saying you are the problem or at least part of the problem. See, what causes quarrels and fights among you, you point to someone else. What James is doing is he's pointing back at you. You are the problem, or at least part of the problem. Listen, no matter how wrong someone else may be, James is saying, hey, it takes two to tango, my friend. If a fight breaks out, no matter how wrong someone else may be, if a fight results, all of a sudden you are part of the problem. Let me just make something very, very clear. And what I'm about to say, y'all, is tough. It's a tough pill to swallow. And, and I, as I was writing this message, I tried my best to find a way out of saying this because I really didn't want to say it. But you just can't, after a lot of prayer and a lot of Bible study, I realized that you just can't, you can't avoid this truth in God's word. So listen closely. I'll try to make it really clear. Conflict is unavoidable. Can't avoid it. Tension is is unavoidable. Disagreement is unavoidable. Being hurt by someone in your life is unavoidable. But fighting back is a sin. It's, it just is. And that's a hard pill to swallow because we love to fight, right? I know I do. Like if someone offends me, if someone says something insulting to me, or if someone says something insulting to my wife or my child, man, I want to fight back. Now, that's what I want to do. I want to retaliate with even harsher words, and I'm good at it too, right? Good at tearing people down. I want to hurt that person. I, I will intentionally try to make that person feel terrible inside, especially if I know what buttons to push. I'm definitely guilty of that. I don't know about you guys, if, but I am. When someone insults me, when someone offends me, when someone attacks me, I want to retaliate. But listen, guys, no matter what the other person said to me, no matter what the other person did to me, no matter how justified I may be in fighting back with that person, here's the hard truth. If I do it, it's still a sin, no matter how justified I may be. We love the fight, right? I think about the movie John Wick. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but basically he's about this guy who, uh, who, who's, who has his, his dog who he loves, his puppy that he loves, and, and someone kills his dog. And so the whole movie, he's, he's killing all these people. He goes on this killing spree just to get his revenge. And you're watching John Wick, and you're like, yes, yes, yeah, kill them all. They deserve it because they killed your dog, right? John Wick is justified, right? But James says that getting even, fighting back, is still a sin, no matter how justified it may be. Because at the core of it, it's selfishness, it's pride. It's about you getting even. It's about you getting your revenge. It's about you, 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 you. But following Jesus, the Bible is very clear about this. Following Jesus is about denying yourself. It's about giving up your selfish desires. It's about giving up your rights. I mean, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. A king, God, gave up his rights. He was born in a cave with a bunch of animals. He was homeless. And then he was beaten and spat on and murdered. He allowed himself to be all those things. He gave up his rights. So back to John, back to John Wick. John Wick killed those people because they killed his dog, right? But really, as, as awesome as it is, as good as it feels to, to see him get his revenge, he was ultimately just being selfish. He was just being prideful. Was he done wrong? Yes, he was. But him fighting back was rooted in selfishness. He was getting his revenge. He was getting his justice. It sounds good to us. It feels good to us, but it's the opposite of what Jesus would do. It's the opposite of what Jesus did. And James says it's wrong. 
James says that fighting is wrong because fighting is rooted in pride and pride is the most destructive sin of all. That's ultimately what James is saying here. So where, and where in the world, by the way, is James getting this? Where is he getting this? Is he just making this teaching up? No, he's getting this from his older brother. He's getting this from something Jesus said. I want to pull up a passage in Matthew 5. This is Matthew 5, 38 through 42. These are the words of Jesus. Listen to this. You have heard the law that says the punishment must match the inquiry. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Man, that sounds good, right? Yeah, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Get your revenge. Get even. You've heard that said. But listen to what else Jesus says. But I say, do not resist an evil person. You know what this means, what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying, but I say, don't fight back. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. If you are sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier, and by the way, the audience Jesus was speaking to would have associated soldiers with the enemy. That was their enemy. The soldiers were, the Roman soldiers were oppressing them at this time. The Roman soldiers were their enemy, but Jesus is saying, hey, if your enemy demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. That's what Jesus said. And that's where James is getting this from his older brother, Jesus. And this is not just some little self-help advice from Jesus and his brother, James. This is not just some little tip for a happier and healthier, stress-free life. That's not what this is. No, this is world-changing stuff. Think about this, guys. Can you imagine what the world would be like if everyone listened to what James is saying here? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what this world would be like if everyone started turning the other cheek when they were slapped? If everyone gave up their rights, if everyone started putting others before themselves, can you imagine what this world would be like? Y'all, there would be no murder. None. There would be no abuse. None. There would be no rape. There would be no robbery. There would be no wars. There would be no poverty. There would be no starving people. There would be no homeless people. This is how you change the world, guys. This is world-changing stuff. Don't write this off. Let's keep reading. We're going to go a little longer tonight, just FYI. We're going to read the entire fourth chapter of James tonight, just because we can, because we're not in any huge rush. We're not physically meeting together. And so if you've got big plans tonight, don't, don't feel bad. You can come back and watch this later, okay? But, but the rest of James chapter 4 is pretty much talking about the same thing that we've been talking about. So let's keep reading. And by the way, if you're still here, type in the comments, I'm still here. In fact, just because I think it would look funny, go ahead and type the poop emoji in the comments right now if you're still watching this, okay? Um, just because I'm childish and I think that'd be funny. So let's keep reading. This is James 4, 4 through 10. James says, you adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think those scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate that the spirit he's placed within us should be faithful to him. And he gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. But come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And he, then he will lift you up in honor. There's a lot we could get into in that, in that passage, but we're going to stick with our, with our main theme tonight, kind of the overall theme of what James is saying. So let's keep going. If we start fights... If we start fights, if we fight back when we're hurt or when we're offended by someone else, if we give into the temptation to get even and to get our justice and to get our revenge, if someone says something to you that's hurtful and you respond by saying something hurtful back, if someone punches you and you punch them back, if, you're, if your teacher gives you a hard time and, and you start being disrespectful or your mom or your dad or your guardian or whoever starts giving you what you think is a hard time and you start being disrespectful back, 
Well, they were disrespecting me, so I'm not going to give them respect. If that's you, if you respond to conflict and disagreements and offenses by fighting back, y'all, James is saying, that is of the world. That is worldly stuff. That is what the world does. But that is the opposite of how God works. James says, if you call yourself a Christian and you respond to conflict that way, you're an adulterous person. And adultery means to cheat, basically. We use this word a lot in marriages, like when a husband cheats on a wife, it's adultery. When a wife cheats on a husband, when we fight to get what we want, when we fight to get even, when we fight back, we are cheating on God with the world, committing adultery. We're adulterous people. Because when we do that, when we do that, we're putting our trust in the world and we're rejecting God. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Listen to what James says says, you can't be friends with God in the world. If you're friends with the world, you're an enemy of God. Do you get that? If you are friends with the world, you are an enemy of God. I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to be an enemy of God, right? You don't, you don't flex on God, right? You Don't be an enemy of God to be friends with the world. You can't be friends with God and the world. The same way a husband can't have a relationship with his wife and another woman. Because, see, friendship is all about trust. You, you trust your friends. A good relationship between you and a friend is built on trust. You trust. Like, I have this friend that I used to work for and with. Uh, I used to do land surveying um, for a couple of years. And, uh, man, we would go in some of the nastiest, most dangerous-looking places, walk through swamps with alligators and snakes and all sorts of stuff. And it was kind of scary stuff, right? But... I was with my friend, and, and he had done this a lot longer than I had, right? I was working for him. And when we'd walk through these scary places, I, I, places I wouldn't go in by myself just for fun, but I went in with him because I trusted him. I trusted that he knew what he was doing, and I literally would walk in his footsteps because I trusted him. When you fight to get what you want, you are trusting the world. You are trusting the world's ways. But when you turn the other cheek and you resist the temptation to fight back, you are trusting God. It's all about trust. Someone starts a rumor about you, how do you respond? Someone hurts you, how do you respond? Someone hurts someone you love, how do you respond? Someone, someone disrespects you, how do you respond? Do you start a fight or do you let it go? This is hard stuff, guys. Following Jesus ain't easy. Nobody ever said it would be. If you start a fight, you are trusting the world's ways. The world says get even. The world says fight back. The world says not to let anybody walk on you. Don't let anybody disrespect you. That's what the world says. And if you fight back, you're trusting the world. You're putting your trust in the world. You're being a friend of the world. But if you let it go, you are trusting God. You don't, you're, you're walking through a swamp, so to speak. It's dangerous. It's scary. You don't know what's under your feet, but you're walking God's footsteps. You're trusting God. You are trusting that one day God is going to judge the person who offended you. It's not up to me to judge. It's not up to you to judge. It's not up, for, it's not up to us to get our revenge and to fight back and to get justice. That's not our job. It's not our job to get justice and to judge people. It's our job to love people. That's it. Even our enemies, according to Jesus. And one day, God will serve ultimate justice. If you've been hurt by somebody, I know some of you guys watching this have truly been hurt by someone. And uh, if that's you, I'm not trying to make light of that, but I want you guys to know that one day that person is going to stand before God and answer for what they've done to you. But you have to trust God with that, and you have to let it go. James even goes on to say this, talking about judgment. This is James 4, 11 through 12. James says, don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law. And, and Jesus said once, the law is summed up in, in loving God and loving your neighbor. It's summed up in love. Your job is to love, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone, who gave the law, is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? What right do you have to fight back? 
What right do you have to get even? What right do you have to retaliate? You have no right. So letting it go, turning the other cheek, it's not only giving up your rights, it's not only being humble, but it's trusting God. And isn't that what faith is all to, uh, to begin with? It's putting your trust in God. Turning the other cheek is trusting God with the justice and trusting God with the judgment of the person who punched you or shuttered a room about you or hurt you or abused you or hurt someone or abused someone you love or whatever. But if you don't let that stuff go, you aren't trusting God, you're rejecting God, and you're trusting the world. You're making yourself an enemy of God. If you don't let that stuff go, you aren't being a friend of God, you're being a friend of the world. And, and listen, this, this really all comes down to one thing. It comes down to pride. It comes down to pride. And pride just means puffing yourself up. Pride is thinking that you got it all figured out. Pride is thinking that you, you are above other people. That's pride. But listen, there's no reason for us to be prideful at all. We have nothing to be prideful about. None of us. And, and James ends the chapter by saying that you aren't in control of anything. You have no reason to be prideful. Listen, listen to the, the last passage of, of James chapter 4, the last passage we're going to be in tonight. This is James 4, 13 through 17. James says, look here. You who say today or tomorrow we are going to a certain town and will stay there for a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here for a little while and then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans. And all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not to do it. What James is saying is you aren't in control of Jack squat. You're not in control of anything. If there's one thing this coronavirus has taught us, it's that. And we're not in control of anything. Do you know how many plans have been canceled because of this virus? We're not in control. <laughs> we can fight all we want to in life. We can fight back and we can retaliate and we can seek our own justice and our own revenge all we want to, but it won't change a thing because y'all, we have no real control over anything. Your life is like a vapor. You don't even know if you're going to be alive tomorrow. God is the only one with power. God is the only one that has any sort of real control. He's the only one that can give real judgment and can serve real justice. So humble yourselves before God. Give up your desires. Give up your rights. Give up your pride. Give up your revenge. Give up your justice. Give up your retaliation and trust God with it all. And there's freedom in that, guys. There's peace in that. I mean, the most miserable people are people who are all about themselves. And if you've ever met somebody who's all about themselves, you know that's true. The most miserable people are the ones who try to control everything. The most miserable people are the ones who just can't let stuff go and are always trying to get their way. And don't, nobody's going to respect me. Nobody's going to make me wait in line. Nobody's going to get my order wrong. Those are the most miserable people. But knowing that nothing is in your control, oh, that should give you peace because you can just lean back into the arms of God and just trust him with everything. Trust him with your life. And y'all, I know it may be hard to trust God and to turn the other cheek sometimes, but there's freedom in that and there's peace in that. Peace that passes all understanding. Like I said earlier, if we could all do that, guys, the world would be a different place, a completely different place. Even if this, let me just say this. Even if there is no God, which I have really good reason to believe that there is. I know there is. Even if the, the thing we call the Bible is not the inspired word of God, which I have really good reason to believe that it is, and I know that it is, but even if it's not, you can't argue with the fact that this world would change for the better in drastic, radical ways if we all just did what this book says. You can't argue with that. If you put this into practice, what we're talking about tonight you could change the world. It starts with you. You can be that one difference. And then you can lead other people to Jesus and teach them how, how, to, how to turn the other cheek. Make disciples out of them. You, it starts with you. We say all the time that you can change the world. Well, that's how you do it. You make one little sacrifice at a time. You turn the cheek. So how does faith work tonight? It's humble. It, it, it's not prideful. It turns the other cheek. 
It finds peace and freedom in trusting God. How does someone with genuine faith in Jesus deal with conflict? Well, they don't fight back. They look at how Jesus lived his life, and they do what Jesus did. They don't fight back. They don't seek revenge. They don't seek to get even. They get punched on one side of their face, and they turn the other cheek because they trust God. They trust God with justice. They trust God with judgment. It's hard to do, guys. But listen, like we said, it's how we find true peace in this life. True peace is by trusting God with everything, especially trusting God with the conflict that you face in this life. That is how you will find true peace. That is how faith works. Let's pray. God, your, uh, your word tells us to do some hard things. There are people watching this, God, who have been through some hard stuff. They have been hurt in ways I can't even imagine. But yet your word says, don't retaliate. Your word says to love your enemies. Your word tells us to love our enemies. And to pray for those who persecute us. Some of us have real enemies who are watching this. People who have done some damage to us. And your word tells us to love them. Not to fight back, but to love them. That's how people with genuine faith in Jesus Christ deal with conflict. Father, I pray that you would give every single person watching this video the supernatural strength to turn the other cheek, even when they've been punched, punched so hard that it's knocked them to the ground, punched harder than I can even begin to wrap my head around. Father, I pray you give them the supernatural strength to trust you and to turn the other cheek. Because God, like your word tells us, we will find freedom in that and we will find peace in that in trusting you with everything. So give us the strength to trust you. God, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to open your word and to come together so freely and, and to share your word through Facebook or Instagram or whatever with technology. Thank you for that. Even though we can't meet together physically, we can meet together online, kind of, and share your word online at least and, and give hope to people at least through your word. Thank you for that. You're so good, and you're working good even in the middle of this craziness. God, I do pray um, that things would kind of slow, kind of, kind of in a way get back to normal, but I also pray that, that you would just bring revival when we, whenever we do come back. I pray that you would create a hunger in people's heart for you and your word whenever we do come back. Father, we thank you, we love you, we praise you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you next week, next Wednesday, right here at 6 o'clock.